please welcome Dr. Hank Bounds, Commissioner of Higher Education. Thank you, Marcia. I, I certainly am honored to have the opportunity to visit with you today. I uh, must say that I've spent a good bit of time thinking about uh, what it means to uh, create an environment where there is mutual respect, uh, particularly uh, in a state like ours, uh, where we have uh, so much history that doesn't look like we want it to look. And so um, I'll tell you, I really struggled with this issue. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And, and you know, at the, at the end of the day, I ended with the remark that I make to most groups uh, when, I'm, when I'm speaking to them. And so when I ask myself what the role of education toward a global civilization of mutual respect is, for me it's really pretty simple. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what the question is, the answer is education. And so uh, before I move forward, I want to sort of frame my remarks by telling you a couple of things that I wake up worrying about every day. Uh, the first thing is I, w I worry about whether or not I'm teaching my children, if I'm doing a good enough job teaching my children to be kind to others and to love each to others and to tr really treat folks the way that they, that they want to be treated. And, and that's really a hard lesson. The second thing that I, I will tell you that I spend a lot of time thinking about and worrying about in our state is I, I, I go back to my term as state superintendent and think about all of the places that I visit, that I visited, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've been in every county in this state, in every small town, in almost every school district in the state, and I think about all of those children who simply wouldn't have a shot if it weren't for education. And I think about my background and the way that I grew up, very rural, fairly poor, tough home environment, and I, I think about the people that really sort of saved my life. I had wonderful teachers that saved me. Uh, I don't ever remember my parents reading to me, and I don't ever remember my parents ever having a conversation with me about going to college. But really good teachers saved me. And so, so with sort of that second area is the context that I want to sort of speak from with my premier, prepared remarks. Uh, last Sunday, as most of you know, uh, the memorial for Martin Luther King Jr. was dedicated in Washington, D.C. And when I look around the room tonight, I can't help to think about how pleased he would be to see this kind of event happening in Jackson, Mississippi. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, A religion true to its nature must also be concerned about man's social conditions. Religion deals with both earth and heaven, both time and eternity. Religion operates not only on a vertical plane, but also on the horizontal. Any religion that professes to be concerned with the souls of men and is not concerned with the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them, and the social conditions that cripple them is a dry as dust religion. I think it's important to note that he wasn't speaking of just one religion. He was referring to all religions. I believe it would be heartening to him to know that many different religions were coming together tonight to discuss the social issue that in my opinion is really the answer to the question that we have, and that's education. How do we move toward a global civilization of mutual respect? Again, for me, it's education. Education can end, gener end generational poverty, yet many of our citizens in Mississippi still live in poverty. Education is called the great equalizer, yet not all children enter adulthood, adulthood with the knowledge and skills necessary for a productive and secure life. We have made great strides since Martin Luther King's time in giving children an equal opportunity for education, but obviously we still have miles to go. As citizens and leaders, we must ask ourselves 
why gaps still exist, why place still matters in the quality of education a child receives, and how we can make the changes necessary to ensure that every child receives an excellent education. We know that education can be a game changer for families. Consider this. During the height of the recession, college graduates have less than half the unemployment rate of high school graduates because there are more recession-proof jobs. Unemployment rates in 2009 for high school graduates equaled 9.7%. For college graduates, less than half of that at 4.6%. College graduates earn more. Nationally, those working full-time uh, year-round in 2008 with a bachelor's degree had median, median earnings almost 22,000 more than high school graduates. In Mississippi, median earnings for those 25 and older were 68% higher for those with a bachelor's degree than those with a high school diploma or GED. However, many children are not academically prepared and uh, able to attend college. And so I often get the question, Commissioner, when should we start thinking about preparing our child, our student, for, for college? And, you know, for me, it's really, really simple. For me, the first day of college is preschool. I never have a conversation in a group like this when I, I, I talk about university. So again, I, I would ask you to consider this. Uh, th think about what the research tells us about how the brain develops. 80% of brain development occurs in the first four years of life. Children begin learning at the earliest stages of life and we can't wait until kindergarten to teach them. On average, a child living in poverty has heard 10 million fewer words than an affluent child by age five. All too often, poor children live in environments that are not print or vocabulary rich. Children that don't have appropriate experiences in the early years don't arrive in kindergarten ready to learn. This is, increases the likelihood that they will not be able to read by third grade. Research tells us that these students are exponentially more likely to drop out of school and end up in prison. Providing early educational opportunities for our youngest, most vulnerable citizens is the right thing to do for our children and our state. So whatever you can do to help a child learn to read will have a profound impact on his or her life, but will also have a profound impact on the quality of life we all enjoy. And so I want you to think about uh, what is often thought of as an economics term, the, the, the concept of supply demand. But I want you to think about it in a, in a, a bit of a different way. Uh, we have lots of supply parents and lots of demand parents. We have lots of supply communities and we have lots of demand communities. And so let me explain what I mean by that concept. In a supply family or in a supply neighborhood at a supply school, what ends up happening is kids get what they get. However, in a demand household, in a demand school district, in a demand community, schools, communities deliver what the community demands. Uh, I am very fortunate in that I live in a demand community. Uh, I live in the Madison School District, send my two children, Will and Caroline, to school at Madison Station, and it's a demand school. If student performance failed there, or if student behavior, or all the other th issues, all the other things that we want for our children uh, deteriorated in any way, what would happen? Think about that for just a moment. Our community would not tolerate that for a moment. However, there's so many children growing up in places where they don't know what good looks like. I grew up in a place where it's not that my parents didn't love me. My parents loved me and wanted the best for me. But the, the, the issue was is they just didn't know what they didn't know. We have so many folks in the state that have never seen beyond the next cotton field, over the next catfish pond. They've never seen around the corner. They don't know what good looks like. And so they don't know how to hope and have dreams and great aspirations for their children. 
And so part of what I want to say to you tonight is that this body, I think, has a real obligation in that regard. You touch every corner of the state, every county of the state, every community of the state, and I think we have an, an obligation to our youngest, most vulnerable citizens to make certain that they are really, uh, that, that, we try, that we build those demand communities. I think we have a responsibility to lift up all children and help them to gain the skills needed to lead a successful and productive life. Tonight is about putting differences aside and coming together for the greater good. There can be no greater good than embracing all children and helping them to feel, fulfill their potential and achieve their dreams. When we give them the key of reading, we unlock the whole world for them. When we teach them to, to read, they will learn how to explore their own faith and the other religions around the world. When we give them critical thinking skills, we help them to be able to discern the differences and similarities between different races, cultures, and religions. We help them to understand their place in the world and the responsibility they have in making the world a better place. Martin Luther King Jr. also said, this is the great new problem of mankind. We have inherited a large house, a great world house in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture and interests, who because we can never again live apart, must learn somehow to live with each other in peace. Without education, there can be no understanding. Without understanding, there can be no peace. Thank you for the opportunity to allow me to join you tonight for this celebration of understanding and peace. Thank you for recognizing the role of education toward a global civilization of mutual respect and for understanding the role that each of us plays in helping all our children to receive an excellent education. Thank you.